All right, guys, welcome to The Conscious Endeavor. Here we are talking about consciousness, self, reality, perception, all the crazy stuff, all the good things, integrating everything. Um, you know, here we are, another episode. I think we're going to dive a little bit deeper into reality. We talked about that a little bit last um, episode. So we're going to dive a little bit b- deeper into that. Maybe talk about a little bit of the doors of perception, talk about um, how we interface with reality. There's something very interesting for me, um, especially in like the psychological neurological end, mm. you know, how does the brain physically actually interface with reality, mm. right? How it transfers information from our environment into our minds. How does it? Like, a, right? like it's like... <laughs> well, there's the, the interesting thing in philosophy, they have the brain and the vat theory, mm. right? Where it's like, you know, your brain is in your skull. It's completely dark in there. There's no information. There's no, nothing going on. It can't... The only thing it has is the access to the outside, mm. right? So we have that kind of idea that, like, everything that's coming into it or potentially even with the brain in the vat theory, that we could really just be a little brain in a vat. If you've seen the, if you guys have seen the movie The Matrix, when you have a human all plugged up, right? You could yeah. put in whatever information into the sensory system that you want. Yeah. Right. So it's curious to think where does this sensory information come from? How can that sensory information be manipulated? Or you know, in what way does it um, come to us? Mm. You know, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in layman's terms, I would think uh, it's coming from our eyes, our sight. I'm sorry, that is our sight, right? Our um, our ears, our touch, our sense of smell, and then you know, it goes into it goes goes more molecular or these EMF waves, you know, being hit with these radiation. Um, you know, it's also information. Like, it's interesting how whenever the sun's out, there's like this automatic feeling of it's a warm day, even though it's like mm-hmm. winter. But if you got sun, for some reason, it's still warming. And, you know, you can have that illusion when I'm getting into perception. Like, but mm-hmm. you gotta, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's just interesting to see that. And I know that um, it, you're talking about the brain. I know that they show that when you are um, in, like, alignment in the spiritual sense, you know, I've seen that people's brain is more active. That's when they get into meditative states, it lights up more. And when they get into, let's say, psychedelics, like, right. you know, different parts of your brain light up. So. Or different parts of your brain are sharing information normally that don't share information, mm-hmm. too. And this maybe hits on the idea of perception here is that, you know, the thought processes that are internal to us, that are intrinsic, like how our thought processes run mm-hmm. in a way are, is a byproduct of how pieces of our brain are communicating. You know, for example, language... Um, you know, is lateralized to the left hemisphere. So we have language and we're learning and we have a kind of self-narrative which perpetuates, right, but which is also reinforced by the general functioning of the nervous system, Mm -hmm. right? If you're an anxious person or if you're a calm person, like on, you know, the average, right, you might have a thought and if you're an anxious person, that thought might escalate. Mm -hmm. You have a language and then all of a sudden now you're going to try to rationalize that with language. But in terms of, you know, psychedelics or spiritual experience, you know, we do have and we do see more coherence in the brain, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. You know, more more communication between those specific parts of the brain. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is what becomes interesting to me because this is, our perception is not only, um, you know, the sensory experience, but also how our mind propagates information. And where does information come from, especially in this sense of mediumship and channeling, mm-hmm. right? Where is that source of information and what mechanism is that source of information? It's a, it's a question that science really, um, you know, is still not really asking and I think it's you know curious to think about that yeah you know uh, the way I kind of see it right now or the way I experience is I feel like we're antennas and we receive information from the ethers and the ethers are these frequencies that we can capture you know they say that we can only see I don't I mean you might know better than I do like if it's one percent of what actually is on this in this realm and then the rest of the stuff is invisible like in mediumship you're able to talk to people who have passed away or have left this physical realm that we see but uh was it density that it goes to that we see the most dense things and then there's there's so many things that are like less dense that are all around us at all times that's how you have those experiences where you hear a whisper sometimes or you can kind of sense something coming it's just this energetic thing that your brain is receiving Mm -hmm. so like when i do readings for people I, I just feel like it's more like a oracle based thing where I'm like literally tapped in and I'm just receiving information from all these other places um, mm-hmm. all around us. And sometimes they come in different forms right. of energy. And this is not something I was trained on. It's just something that um, 
right? Happened one day. Or you became know? attuned to in attuned a way. To it. I mean, which is interesting because again, talking about these perceptions, if these are not, there's not specific, as far as we know, as far as we study, there are not specific sensory mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the light is the eye, you know, hearing, vibrations, sound waves are the ears, you know, but in terms of these kind of other um, sensory perceptions, especially when they're internal, when they're messages, when they're energies, I mean, you know, we all, uh, every day, um, everyday people, we're all looking around and, we're all, and we get a vibe from somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that? You know, and there's science now starting to dive into things like HeartMath, um, which is an organization doing research on the toroidal field, mm -hmm. um, the magnetic field of the earth. I mean, sorry, of the heart. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know what I mean? The earth um, does have a magnetic field too, which it is... It also uh, does, yeah, right? Coincides. So <laughs> coinciding, right? All, you know, um, entities in this way, right, mm -hmm. have this magnetic field and any change in a magnetic field can induce current as we talked about like last time. Right, so electromagnetism is a dual force, and it's like when there is perturbation in these magnetic fields, is there a sense there? Because other animals, like for example, sharks, mm -hmm. have this electromagnetic sense. They have yeah. specific organs that we can trace, at least neurologically, we can see the pathways. And this is why science accepts their ability to do so, because mm -hmm. we can trace those pathways. Um, but you know, the human brain is ridiculously complex, a hundred billion neurons connecting to a, you know, a thousand you know, or one neuron connecting to a thousand other ones with a hundred billion of them, uh -huh. you know. What's the number in a shark, though? Like, how, what's, what are their numbers? Well, I don't know the numbers yeah. specifically, but they have this organ. It's called um, the Ampullae de Lorenzini. And I think Lorenzini's you just... You heard it here first. Yeah, right? I think Lorenzini is just the name of the guy who came up with it or found it, you know. Yeah. But it's like these little jelly-filled things that are on their snout, mm -hmm. and they right. actually are able to pick up on these magnetic fields, right? Because again, the heart rate of a fish yeah. that's next to them is giving off these pulses and these, these currents and things like that. And they're able to pick up on those vibrations. They have a similar thing that like travels down the line of their spine where they're able to pick up on that. So in terms of the science, it's really like if we haven't found the mechanism for how it happens, mm -hmm. we just kind of assume it doesn't exist. Yep. And that's a, a problem with the scientific community. Yeah, I mean, and that's also like, where's the funding going to research what, right? And yeah, to, it's pretty big. <laughs> to circle back to the shark, um, you know, I, yeah, of course, we've all watched Shark Week, and I watched um, how they would touch that part of the sh shark that you're talking about, it's like its snout right by right. its mouth. And when you touch it, it puts it into a state of like, I don't want to say paralysis, but it turns it over and it just becomes like, mm -hmm. um, just it just lays there like in a meditative state. And when you, I've seen someone ride a great white shark, and you guys can look this up on YouTube, after he touched that part of the shark, the shark like you know became super friendly with him, and they right. started going back and forth. Right. And that's really interesting to see. And it's kind of like um, you know, circling back to perception or you know information, you know, it's how are we trained? What are the things that we are trained from in school? You know, because there are other places around the world um, where people are attuned at a younger age to understand who they are and what they are. You know, we are we perceive everything, I mean, at least I should say for myself, I shouldn't speak for you in this, but like, all right, well, for, when you're a child, what's, what do they teach you? They teach you like a little bit of art, a little bit of reading, and then they're like, oh, what do you want to be, a police officer, a, a pilot, an astronaut, and all these things, and I don't know how many astronauts really exist, but that's another story, <laughs> and like. It's a hard barrier of entry there. Yeah, it's like, why are you even showing us that? But uh, that's another story. Um, the there's there's this tribe they talk about in Africa called the Dogon tribe, and I, I believe uh, you, you know about them then, right? You, yeah, I've heard a little bit about them. Yeah, okay. They they are, were aware of Sirius yeah. star, right, which yeah. is not visible to the naked eye allegedly. Right. Yeah, super and, strange. They uh, and they say that and and you know quote I mean I'm just saying there's a tribe that I know of that they talk about the children are kept in dark caves while they're growing up so that way that they are in tune with with the infinite they're in tune with the divine and that's right. why they come out with all this information that they they already they already know wow. like they say that they already knew about our star systems before modern technology they've never had exposure to it they've known these things without telescopes and all these things that we use so it's really interesting um yeah. about information how we get it and where does it really come from right because here are people who are being kept in a cave and they're they're getting all this information and if you really think about it we got a lot of the stories of the messengers of god they have all had this experience with some sort of going away from society and going into uh a a space where it's like just a reclusive state yeah 100 percent. all the monks they always go into the forest and they live their life do that yeah the prophets go into a cave the, or mm -hmm. on, upon a mountain you know away mm -hmm. from society because there are some there's more information out there than we we learn in schools and i think that's a, something that i 
I understand more now, you know, just that vibe isn't for everybody when it comes to schooling and information is all around us. This is being open and attuned to it. And the easiest way to be attuned to it, I think this universal information is getting into, getting into a meditative state or going out in nature and being one with it. And that is where you'll find the most divine and you can take it back with you. I know some people say you find the divine wherever you're at, but I, I yeah. think it's a little easier in those type of environments. I think it's a skill that you do develop. I think the better you get at that skill probably is easier to tap into. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the first time you lift a weight, it might be heavy. You do yeah. it multiple times, it becomes easier, mm -hmm. right? Um, something interesting about that too is in terms of like the sensory deprivation, which happens, right? Yes. Um, because <clears throat> if you're in a cave, for example, like these these kids who are growing up in this cave, um, humans are, are visual creatures, right? Mm. Our Most of our brain, the largest portion of our brain is really for visual processing. We're very visual based. For example, like dogs are very uh, sense, uh, mm. smell, mm -hmm. right, based. Um, so humans are visual creatures. So taking away visual stimulus, like if you're in a cave, the brain is now going to allocate resources for other you know, types of perception, right? Yes, um, they actually have studies that in blind individuals where um, people who are born blind, their brain, the occipital of the back of the brain that normally processes vision, isn't being used, mm -hmm. right? So what actually ends up happening is they start to, um, behaviorally, they start to like really pick apart the auditory stimulus. So mm -hmm. they can make a sound, they can knock on wood, and based on how it sounds, they can tell the size of the room, yes, right? Yes. So all of these parts of the brain, mostly the parts that used to um, process vision, right, now go towards processing spatial reasoning or spatial information from auditory information. Yes. So the brain is very highly adaptable and there's like probably a lot of credence to these people going into this cave, attuning the sensory system, getting rid of our largest sense, which mm -hmm. is vision, mm -hmm. and then trying to see what other perceptions you have when that's not in the way. Yeah. You know? I, I, I seen that um, there used to be a show called Stanley Superhumans. Uh, it was a it was a really dope show. Um, they showed this blind guy living in Mexico who could ride his bike and go through caves. What he would do is he'd make a clicking noise with his mouth, right. and it would send this vibration out. And then he'd he get he'd get information back. It's kind of like they I think bats have that utilize mm -hmm. that and dolphins. Yeah. So yeah. like that sonar type of um, radar type of um, technology. We're all capable of it, right. and it's just the human. It, we're so amazing. It's just yeah. stepping into that and knowing there's more than we currently know and tapping into that infinite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to drop the science on that, the super olivary complex um, in the brainstem actually uh, understands and can compare the difference in volume mm -hmm. and in speed of sound between the ears. Right, mm -hmm. so if a sound is coming at you from one specific angle, mm -hmm. it's actually going to hit this ear a millisecond before it hits this ear. And those time differences, mm -hmm. there's a specific part of your brain that registers those time differences, and you'll know exactly where the sound is based on that difference between your ears. So your your brain is highly attuned for that also because that's just survival necessary. It's necessary for survival to know where a threat is coming from, where mm -hmm. a sound is coming from, or able for us to react to it. Wow, that's a, and you know what, you use this word, I, you know, it just slipped my mind and now it's back, um, the sensory deprivation. Like I've right. been in one of those like float tanks and- um, Highly recommended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, there's something about that, and that's that training, you know what right. I'm saying? Like, I know people like, hey, I'm gonna go do some training, I'm gonna go to the gym. Yo, if you go to one of these places, like you're sitting in a dark, completely dark room, mm -hmm. your senses do pick up. If you uh, go to these uh, flotation tanks, your senses do pick up. It puts you in a state of like, it feels like you're just flying or just, you know, completely floating but in darkness right and in that you can tap into more of your senses i didn't i didn't know the science behind it like until you just brought it up but it makes sense i mean that's why i, I think i've seen people on there's one guy on stan lee's he could smell a gun in a room he could smell what? anything in a room yes yes you guys can what does a gun smell yeah, like i don't know i mean maybe the metal or something like because you ever like get like a new car and there's yeah. like leather you can kind of smell the leather yeah. i guess metal has a certain smell well but he that's really specific yeah he, he he's i think i don't know if it was the feds or the cia that would um they, they tested on him because his nose was stronger than right. some sort of hound no uh, way. Yeah. No yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Oh my this god. This is real. Listen, the ultimate human is like is wow. All it is almighty. Like right. when we talk about the divine, like we are capable of amazing things. Like it's yeah. just it's just yeah, remembering yeah. that and tapping that. If you really think about it, there's a tribe in uh, the Philippines. Um, I saw a post about it where they go spear fishing underwater and they stand underwater on these rocks to get these fish and they're standing there for a while time and they're throwing a spear in the water. Mm -hmm. So just to think about that, what strength, yeah. what, you know, 
to breathe underwater that to be underwater that long and to you know hold yeah. your breath to to be a hunter underwater i mean one thing yeah. to be a hunter on land now you're hunter in the yeah. water like that and yeah i mean i always like to say that the, the body adapts to what the mind chooses in mm -hmm. a way you know whatever the mind is capable of deciding and saying we're going to do this right the body will make the adaptations to make that possible if you every single day maybe fa a fact of your environment also, but your mind says, all right, we got to get in the water, we got to go fishing, we got to do this, we got to get more food, mm -hmm. we got to blah, blah, blah. The mind is making those commands, the body is now going to make the adjustments to do so. Mm -hmm. The second you put your body underwater, you know, your diaphragm is going to compress, you have more compression on your body, you have mm -hmm. all this sorts of stuff happening. You know, the body is going to make these physiological um, changes in order for you to survive. Your body mm -hmm. is, in a way, maybe we could say the body is unconscious, um, so to speak, right? But it's literally just reacting to the conditions that are around it. When you do cold exposures, yes. your skin tightens, your your uh, your veins, you know, constrict mm -hmm. to restrict blood flow. Your heart rate kicks up, your metabolism kicks up to burn more energy, to burn more fat, and your body just unconsciously allegedly unconsciously does these things right when your mind puts you puts you in certain circumstances your body's just going to react to those circumstances yeah. you know it's really it's that's that's why I let you say that because I just did a cold plunge on um, New Year's Day right and uh, went to the ocean and it was super it was just freezing but I will tell you it yeah. was so amazing it was such a exhilarating rush. yeah yeah and it made you it, like that sense of I know I always feel alive but to, that that's a different feeling alive and mm -hmm. it's really amazing and it's it's it goes to show like that's not something I would have tried any time, maybe two years ago, three years ago, but now that I know about cold plunges and how beneficial they are for you, I, I'm a big advocate for it. On top of that, it's one of those things like, we were taught limiting beliefs when we were children through our family, through our culture, through That the music. cold makes you sick. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, like, don't yeah. go outside when it, with your wet hair in the yeah. cold because it's gonna make you, like, yeah. sickness comes from viruses. Like, yeah. how is that? equate to I don't know yeah you know and it, it's wild because when I was a child I used to I would wear a coat maybe but I wear flip-flops all the time and even in the winter right. even two three feet of snow I'd go out it's it, crazy it, yeah dude that's crazy it, <laughs> but that's, that, that goes to show you that this is like right people putting limiting beliefs on it's you. mental yeah and right. when, when people talk about their your senses you know we're we're taught five senses you know we're taught five senses which science already admits there's more yeah with, all right, there you go. That's Thermoception, good... nociception, you know, all sorts of different things. So, and that that to me is like it. It goes back to like our schooling and our education. Mm -hmm. I, I I wish they would. I know there are some schools they talk about. They have a meditation uh, routine, but um, ultimately, it's something that we should all incorporate in our lives. It doesn't have to be this thing that you might find corny or something. It could just be sitting down and listening to your breath and focusing on your breath. It could be just maybe saying one word, focusing on one word, and. It'll slow down all the clutter that goes on in the brain and it'll help you bring in more information, let go of things that might not serve mm -hmm. you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, quieting the mind is, is a huge practice, especially for just tuning into. I mean, it's funny, too, because if I don't meditate for a while and I sit down and meditate, mm -hmm. I will literally sometimes just have a, a pen and paper like mm -hmm. next to me because like I'll sit there for two minutes. And I'm like, oh, that was what I was supposed to do this morning. Mm -hmm. Like the one thing I forgot and I'll sit there longer. Yeah. And then something will come to me I have to do next week. Right. Yeah. And the funny thing is, it's really time expansive it's like oh that was this morning and then this but the more the longer i sit mm. the more that i kind of expand oh last month mm. like i should have went down this avenue i should have networked with this person i should have done this or whatever and it's funny too because a lot of the insights that come are like really insightful it's mm. always like killing like four birds with one stone type thing where it's just like <laughs> oh if i just did this one thing yeah. right it's very hyper efficient i feel like if we get out of our own way consciously speaking because um, our conscious mind is very reactive mm. you know it's very like um, based on surface level interactions in a way if I'm going to yeah. say yeah. you know I think our unconscious mind is stronger in terms of you know computing power mm. um, our conscious mind is just sitting here being like I like the color blue like yeah. you know Stephanie was mean to me yesterday you know like whatever uh, whatever you know yeah. just these very kind of like you know interesting thing I'm hungry right I, I really want a burger right mm -hmm. you know what I mean this is what your conscious mind is doing mm -hmm. but your unconscious mind is literally like you know maintaining your metabolism mm -hmm. and like being aware of the mitochondria like your mitochondria are like just like communicating in biophotons to like transcript your DNA mm -hmm. study came out recently talking about how bio uh, 
the mitochondria, everyone knows the powerhouse of the cell, yeah. right? Everybody knows that, right? Yeah. Um, so the powerhouse of the cell actually communicates with biophotons mm. to the DNA structures to actually change and modulate the expressions of DNA. So for example, mm. doing cold exposures, mm. mitochondria are producing cellular energy, mm. right? So if they get these shocks, the whole nervous system gets these shocks, now the mitochondria has this kick up, mm -hmm. right? All of a sudden it could be communicating to the DNA to create whatever, whatever. Um, I was reading also the, the shiver response mm. when your body shivers, mm. that actually increases an amount of growth hormone mm. because your body is literally trying to generate heat and it's realizing it doesn't have enough mass to maintain that temperature. So it actually, the shiver response is actually also not only you know a, a response in the immediate, but it actually increases the amount of growth hormone for us to build like denser muscles and all sorts of stuff. But it's a natural process to cycle. Wow. So let me circle back because that was a lot of amazing information. The biophotons. Oh, yeah. What, 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 how does that play? What is that exactly? Well, as far so as the... in terms of internal communication, you know, you mm. got to understand what the cell is doing, right? Mm. The cell the cell itself does like 100,000 processes per second, mm -hmm. right? You know, we are mean? ultimately super, super computers. Yeah, no, 100 percent. And this is I'm glad you said that word because what I like to say is that the conscious mind is the baby in charge of the supercomputer. Yeah. Because your your conscious <laughs> mind is like, wow, blue is a great color, and yeah. like, you know, um, I should call yeah. my mom, yeah. and you know, like also <laughs> random random things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that they're not important, but they're yeah. just kind of random surface level things. When you really get your conscious mind out of the way, mm. and you start like diving deeper in there, um, there are a lot of unconscious communication. So going back. Biophotons are allegedly a way that the mitochondria are communicating. So they're actually sending photons. Photons are, you know, as we know, light, mm -hmm. right? The sun obviously produces light. That's why it's important to get the sun in the morning at right. that, that time before. Right, 100%. Photon, sun light is actually proven scientifically to change the, the um, you know, the functioning of, of mitochondria. Mitochondria will actually, you know, attune to or they change their functioning when you have a certain amount of sun exposure. Mm -hmm. um, there are whole classes on this and stuff like that, so I don't want to go super deep into it. It's not like 100% my forte, but I've been lightly read up on this stuff. But um, yeah, so inside the cell, we have all of these processes happening, at 100,000 of them per second. You really mm -hmm. got to think about like, how do they communicate? How do they coordinate? How do they not run into each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like one thing that's building like a, a part of the cellular membrane runs into a ribosome who's building a protein who's like transcripting the DNA. Like how do these things not run into each other? And it's mm. there is an internal communication system. And what they found is that some of these mitochondria are, you know, using biophotons. So photons being light, um, they're really derivative. They can shoot off of electrons. Mm -hmm. Electrons can absorb light and they can give off light. Um, and this will change their orbital pattern, right? Mm. And this is like kind of some crazy science, right? But we have the the neutron, the you know, the nucleus and the electron. The electron is just orbiting around. The more light it exposes, it'll actually go to a higher orbit, right? The electron. Mm. So, and then if it gives off a lot of light, yeah. it'll come closer, and it'll come to a smaller orbit. Mm. So the amount of energy it, it like you know uh, absorbs or releases, it'll change its orbital pattern. And they're very capable of doing this. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, a lot of hydrogen being used. Water is hydrogen and oxygen, right? So mm. there's so much use of hydrogen. Your body breaks down water and takes off the hydrogen, uses that hydrogen to just, you know, do a bunch of other cellular processes. Mm. It's it's really weird. It's really wild. And actually, it all makes sense. Know. So now that you like broke that down, it makes so that's why we talk about the sun being so vital for us and how important it is to get the sun and sunlight. And when you get sunlight, what it does for your body, people genuinely, in my experience, aside from diet, right? Aside from diet, they look younger, they feel younger, they're more energetic, they have a, a, a glow to them, you know, and I'm not even talking about like that tan thing, they just have a glow to them. And they're in higher vibrations, which is really key. And then people who do cold plunges, it has the same effect. Now I'm not saying that you need all of that, but I'm saying it is amazing the effects that it has on your body and there's a scientific way of breaking down what goes at, what goes inside the body, how it's communicating with each other. I didn't realize that, but now that you've broke that down, it makes so much sense. Like why it's so important to have these mm -hmm. things. And that's something to just to, to keep in mind. Um, perception, you know, it, it comes back to that too. It's like, you know, I was talking to somebody, they're like, look, too much sun is bad for you. It can kill you. It can give you cancer. Well, there's something that uh, a report I was reading about. It's actually the things that people are eating 
that are giving them this this sun this this cancer that they're getting the skin cancer it's not necessarily the sun it's this just that what they're eating because right. there are places where people live in you know the caribbean northern africa and all these places and they don't have this widespread crazy skin cancer going on it's right. happening in specific countries where there are i mean i don't want to go down that you know but it's the diet it is it is right. it is diet because yeah. yeah, I mean, diet will influence the mineral base of the body, and that's mm -hmm. extremely important. Like a lot of, um, you know, we had the Dust Bowl here in, yeah. in the North America in like, I don't know, the 20s, or I don't know when the hell that was. <laughs> but the Dust Bowl was basically like the fact that we took all of the minerals out of the soil, and the soil yeah. l lost its ability yeah. to hold itself together, and it became like dust and yeah. sandy, and then all of that wind in the Midwest just kicked it up, and it just became a whole, you know, crazy thing. So there's a certain... Um, importance in the mineral base not only of the soil mm -hmm. then of the food right because the food like for example corn like pulls nitrogen out of the ground yeah right different um i think beans actually put nitrogen in the ground they're actually mm -hmm. good to like plant together for example mm -hmm. um but your body also will absorb these um these these minerals nitrogen uh magnesium mm -hmm. all of these things are incredibly important to your cellular metabolism mm -hmm. in itself and if you have a certain amount of sun exposure it's definitely high key interesting to understand that if you have a certain amount of let's say magnesium or calcium in your body mm -hmm. it's going to affect the way that your body is able to you know transfer that energy mm -hmm. like if we look at solar panels right solar panels literally have a specific um, you know chemical or molecule that's able to uh, you know, strip electrons from itself mm -hmm. um, when it gets too excited by photons. And, and there's an electrical, as we said, like an electron transport chain, which is literally um, how our cells produce energy, but the electron transport chain, I mean, if you think about how we're going to disperse that energy, if, if we lose the ability to kind of disperse that energy across the surface of the skin, you know, we are, they could probably affect us in a negative way. If there's mm -hmm. too much energy, mm -hmm. right? What happens if like, you know, if, for example, a nuclear power plant gets like too much energy, right? Yeah. It's going to explode, right? Mm -hmm. For example, it could, there could lead to damage, um, things in that nature. But the sun really does catalyze, not only in that nature, but it does catalyze a lot of cellular processes. Yeah. Like we know, for example, that the whole vitamin D production, our body produces mm -hmm. vitamin D when it's given sunlight yeah. so there are me metabolic processes that are kicked off by that mm -hmm. um you know in cold plunges that's all about adrenaline and norepinephrine and dopamine increases like 300 percent um after like post you know love that um, dopamine yeah, yeah right so i mean there's like obviously like you know natural intrinsic systems and it's just interesting because all of these things are internal vitamin d production we're internally producing it's mm -hmm. catalyzed by the exposure of sunlight right we we have norepinephrine which is adrenaline Right. And all these things and dopamine, those are released when we get cold exposure. So it's like very specific exposures, you know, that act, kind of activate these internal mechanisms in the body, mm -hmm. which is really interesting that that kind of external catalyst and our internal response. But, mm -hmm. you know, a big a big, you know, leeway back and forth. Um, it, taking it, you know, just taking your body and putting it in different circumstances, natural circumstances, because right. you know what, there are people in societies that live in cold weather, like Eskimos or mm -hmm. like, you know, the Siberia and like Siberian culture. There's, a, I mean, they're all over. The world. I'm just bringing those up for an example. And those people do go into these waters. Iceland, they all go into those springs. I know they're warmer, but the thing is, like, they they do have that cold exposure anyway when they're standing there, getting yeah. in there. There's, uh, you know, there's people who have tested the limits of the human body, and, and you know, one of the more popular ones is uh, the way. Hoff guy, you know what I'm saying? He's over here showing people what the human body can do, and that's just one element, yeah. you know what I'm saying? That's just him, you know, this guy's going up a mountain butt naked, you know what I'm saying? He's, you know, you know they injected him with E. coli? Yes. yes they put E. coli in his bloodstream. Mm -hmm. They literally injected him with it, and he did this breathing, the breathing technique that he, you know, famously uh, touts, and he didn't really get sick. Yeah, and then um, they did it on his students, too. And then, yeah, that's which it. is absolutely insane. You know what I mean? Because then it's also like doing it on his students in terms of science as well mm -hmm. is to say that, well, maybe you're a genetic anomaly. Yeah. And maybe that's why you're, you know, maybe it has nothing to do with the, um, you know, breathing technique you're doing. You're just genetically fit to do that. Mm -hmm. Then, but when you actually orally teach other people the technique and then yeah. they can produce the same results, that's that's good science right there because now you now you're, Verifying, okay, it's not just him, yeah. maybe his genetics, whatever. He's actually able to teach this specific te technique to other individuals and they can propagate the same result, right? And, Perfect science. And that's uh, something that comes back to perception because, like, had you had told me about this 10 years ago or 15 mm -hmm. years ago, I'm like, dude, that's mm -hmm. crazy. But here you got somebody doing it, like, 
ad hoc. I mean, this guy went up a mountain just like, I think it was either naked or just in his shorts. I think it was in his shorts, yeah. 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 Uh, I think yeah, naked would be not great for TV. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they shot the whole thing on TV because, you know, the funny thing is like, you know, which, you know, thank God for social media because like that mm -hmm. way you're able to really talk and talk about these guys because it's not like he's like this popular guy right. on the news and all these things. You're yeah. not, you know what I'm saying? It's not mainstream yeah. media that's covering 100%. Mr. Winhoff over here. It's really us people, you know, we're just talking about this because we see it as something phenomenal. And that's really interesting because when you watch TV, what they find to be phenomenal is like, I don't even know, just garbage stuff that for me, I mean, I shouldn't say that, stuff that really is not pushing humanity forward. It's yeah. keeping humanity in a bit of a, 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 so, a, a loop of gossip and hearsay and you know, right. things that no one really cares about, like politics and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just like. I mean, some yeah. people might care about those things. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. we want to keep it in check. And also, whether or not they're actually talking about policy yeah. on the news. They're really not. They're talking yeah. about slogans and they're talking about goofy things <laughs> half the time. Uh, but not to go down that rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, if we talk about. <laughs> really, I want to talk, again, the, the body's ability yeah. to adapt, right? As we talk about Wim Hof, this guy just doing these cold exposures, doing this breath technique, and he actually had to have a very traumatic experience happen. Yeah. I think uh, I watched a little bit of like a documentary series about him, and he was talking about the death of his wife. He had mm. several children, and his mm. wife um, had passed away, mm. and he found that he could not cope with it. And he actually found that, so he got into these very, very emotionally overwhelming states, and what he found that he was actually able to bring himself out of that using his breath. Um, so prior to all of the cold exposure and all the other crazy physiological things that he was able to do with this, mm -hmm. right, in terms of like warding off a virus, going through extreme cold conditions, mm -hmm. he first found that it was, he could control his emotional state and his state of being through the breath. So it, mm -hmm. it took that traumatic experience for him to actually come to find a, a method of coping mm -hmm. that worked for him as well. I love synchronicities you know. and you know you just hit on something that's a synchronicity i just posted this yesterday on my instagram i was watching um, hashtag time is tight yeah <laughs> time is tight right <laughs> i was watching uh avatar um the second se the second um iteration of cora legend cora and okay. ang had this had this quote he says um at your lowest point you are open to the greatest change mm. and uh that's just wow like right. I, that's that's right. just and you know i know a lot of a lot of us that are probably listening to this podcast, you know, we might be, you know, at a age where we've gone through our childhood already and, you know, we might feel like things are set the way they are. That's not true. Things are not set in stone. You can shift your mentality. You can tap into these things. Winhoff example of it. I'm example of this. Daniel's example of this. So it's really just stepping into that, knowing that the human body, the human mind, your soul, it's capable of such amazing things. And that's what we're talking about here today on The Conscious Endeavor. I just want to remind everybody, you can shift anything in your life. Yeah. I mean, one thing that Wim Hof says, his, his, a famous quote of his that he says that I love, he says, don't wait around for science to tell you what you are. Mm. He said, be yeah. what you are yes. and let yes. science study you. Yeah. And I was just like, Pfft. I was like, that's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my life. Because again, a lot of times, and I see this in the scientific community, that people look into textbooks, especially with psychology even. Mm. You know, you look into textbooks and you say, well, what the textbook says is basically what is, mm. right? And they stop like they kind of it becomes ironically a self-limiting idea in and of themselves if it's not in a textbook well then well how can i give that validity right mm -hmm. and the problem is is that people don't understand that you know science is just about the study of phenomena mm -hmm. and everything is a phenomenon right mm -hmm. i mean we got into this whole debate with dualism and with uh behaviorism to say that if we can't observe it if we can't observe a, a particular behavior mm -hmm. which then grew into a physiological or brain response or something like that if we can't again as i said before if we can't find the physical mechanism for it we you know say it doesn't exist right mm -hmm. and now at the point like you know when we say maybe particularly i don't know if these studies have been done but something be interesting if someone goes into a, a a frame of mind of mediumship or channeling or something like that and we study differences in the brain waves mm -hmm. and there might be fundamental differences of waking brainwave mm -hmm. state which is probably just alpha yeah. or low beta right where you're just chilling right you you have a resting brainwave state. Then you ask that person to go into channeling and then compare those brainwave states. It might be gamma then, you know what I'm saying? Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So even if, 
Right now, all of a sudden, science would say, okay, well, now there's a physical mechanism. We don't know what mediumship is. Maybe a scientist might not accept the validity of that. But look, this person is going from a low beta to into high gamma or whatever it may be or, or whatever that distinct brain response is. Mm -hmm. Also, where that brain response is localized mm -hmm. is really important as well, right? Because where in what part of the brain? Right, we know the brain is localized, right? Which just means that each part of the brain does a specific function, right? My arm, moving my right arm would be up here, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking speech, uh, comprehending speech, they're all in different parts of the brain. So what part of the brain is more active during those, those practices, right? Mm -hmm. Would be an interesting question to ask, but things that they're really not, they're not diving into right what, now. What part of your brain is more active, like when you would do a somersault? Like, you know what I'm uh, sensory motor, like, sensory, your sensory motor cortex, your parietal lobe, um, which is on the top of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a whole body map, actually. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're, um, and you're cross-wired as well. So my right hand is controlled by my left hemisphere. Um, it would be, you know, right mm -hmm. here in the sensory motor strip, which is kind of like in the middle of the head, um, on the side. Wow, you know, you know I, I was just joking too because I, I can't do a summer at literal. this current moment. But hey, you know, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, now I know what part of my brain will be working for that. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting too is the, the perception, right? Reality. You go to the East, there's different philosophies and different studies, mm -hmm. and you know, and then there's you go to the West, it's different. There's there's a lot of, you know, I would say there's more spiritual influences in the East part of the world where you where you don't see as many of these like universities and colleges that are made by what would say what I would say for, from like this Western society. You know what I'm saying? We mm -hmm. talk about college and universities. There are people who have, yeah, they believe in, you know, ancestors and they believe right. in, you know, communicating with them. They believe that, you know, I remember when I was a child, I was watching this thing in India uh, about they had a temple where they all feed the rats because they believe the rats were their ancestors and stuff, wow. you know what I'm saying? And then they have monkey temples there. They still do like it. These things are, and they're able to communicate with them. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I remember when I was growing up, an animal would be considered like, yo, they're nowhere near what a human is. Yeah, in the West, it's yeah. really it's crazy. <laughs> it's funny because I had a, a philosophy of mind teacher like in my yeah. undergrad, yeah. and he was like 70 years old, and yeah. he still had the idea that like the human humans are the only conscious species on oh the planet. Like we're the only intelligent species, allegedly. Yeah. I'm like, did you look at a dolphin's brain? Yeah. Like it's yeah. literally bigger than ours. <laughs> it's literally bigger. Yeah. And like, you know, they have the whole echolocation thing. Yeah. They have super, they have communication. We've started to study into them. They have names. Yeah. Wow, they have names. Like, there's a specific mirrors, sound yeah. Yeah. that they utter that refers to one of them. So it's like, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, like, shit. oh shit! Yeah. You know, that, that's his name. You know, <laughs> that was his cousin. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah, right. So there's different frequencies that, like, because it's like, you know, my name's Daniel, right? Yeah. Tyab, right? Yeah. There's different frequencies. There's yeah. sounds that we make that refer to each other. Yeah, it's literally they literally have names, and they have names for objects as well. Yeah. They've actually put. Um, objects in the tank mm. with these animals and they've noticed that they refer to the same they kind of do the same sound which mm. just means they're naming it they're referring to it right so they have a language yeah. we're just not able to decipher it yeah you know it's I, I mean and I think uh yeah, I think we would be if we put more, you know, 100%. Uh, if we put that, what is it called? Funding towards it. Right. right? It's where right. are we putting funding, right? right? We're funding on other stuff. But to circle back, uh, recently uh, we're, we were talking about the white owl um, and just how, what magical stuff it's capable of, the way it can like twist its head and all these things. And we were how. About that? Oh, I will. Actually, <laughs> I was at this, uh, I went to this yoga thing where they're talking about it. Yeah. And cool. it, it's actually the way it hunts you know it can go all the way like as high up in the air and it, it's able to spot and sense where things are so like right. when we talk about consciousness like that's something that's really important what is consciousness according to the science community because in the, from my example from, from what i've seen right. they've made animals seem like yo you got a bird brain you're this and that but right. like they know what to do right. naturally like they also go, they're, they're more in tune with specific um faculties i feel yeah. like for example eagles and, and owls they have higher um, you know, they also have different, um, there's, there's, I read up on this once, but in an eagle's eye, there's actually like a, literally a reflector lens. So like light comes in once, it mm. bounces off, it hits a reflector lens and gets amplified. Wow. So there's like literally a physical mechanism inside the eye of that animal that makes their perception, um, enhanced. But to, to hit your question here, like what is consciousness mm. in terms of that, in terms of science, yeah. I mean... I think consciousness in a way is synonymous with self-awareness to some degree. Mm. Um, you know, we, we have to say we have conscious states, right? So we're conscious of something. And this is also kind of a, a meditative question in a way, because if you're conscious, what are you conscious of? Mm -hmm. 
And can you be conscious without being conscious of something, right? So it's also because our consciousness becomes very objectified. Well, I'm conscious. Why? How do you know? Because I can see. Because I can see the wall <laughs> yeah. around, the walls around me. I can see this. I can see that. I can feel this, right? So it's you're be conscious of something. It's kind of a product. And in a way, and I'm hit, hitting kind of more of the Eastern, you know, practice on this. Fell out. But because <laughs> you are conscious of something, yeah. your consciousness is here. The thing you're conscious of is right there. So how can you disconnect the thing you're conscious of from you being conscious, right? Mm. So. In, in terms of breaking that apart, breaking that dichotomy, you know, you'd want to go into metacognition or thinking about thinking or being conscious of your consciousness. Mm. And you get this kind of meta-awareness cycle that happens, you know, and that's, for me, how I would dive into and try to respond to that question naturally. Mm. How science would do it, would they would look at particular parts of the brain. Mm. Um, if we want to dive into that, it's called the default mode network. But do you want to chime in here for yeah, a little I'll bit before me, I dive me, yeah, in? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I would say is... Uh, so beautiful points and thank you for explaining that i look at some of the tests that they do on animals like when they're talking about consciousness and the reflection was one thing mm -hmm. do they identify themselves in reflection the mirror the test. mirror, the yes. mirror. Yes. and to me it's like i don't necessarily know if that's conscious because to me it's like when you get when you're conscious and just hyper aware the physical realm it may not be as important it's just like what are you here to do are you doing that and it's mm -hmm. like it's just you being in the zone. So like when you see animals do what they do as far as like hunting or hanging out or chilling, I don't know how important it is to them how they look. Yeah. And that might be something that is right. to, and then some animals are just blind. They're just blind. Mole rats. Yeah, mole rats. And they they can go <laughs> all around. Or maybe I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my my point is like we always, I mean, my in my experience, what I've seen is it always has to be this comparison to human. Like, oh, can right, they build things? Right. Like the honey badger is amazing because the honey yeah. badger, he can use a stick and he can do things with it. Crows are amazing because they can use instruments. Yes, they and use they're tools similar yeah. to how we use tools. Yeah. So that makes them automatically better. Well, my thing is, mm -hmm. like, I feel like every every animal is exactly what it's supposed to be. They don't need to build a little smart city, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? For like, them to be conscious. For them right. to be conscious. Like, well, yeah, it's also like why how we behave you know it's yeah. like is that conscious is behavior conscious like building cities is that a product of intelligence it's like yeah. well if you have emergent intelligence for a dolphin for example they don't need to build things outside of themselves yeah. I mean, we build houses because we can't stand the cold yeah. like that mean that means we're not fit for our environment we actually have to do things externally mm. in order to sit in temperature controlled rooms you know what i mean with our <laughs> food that gets killed and delivered for us microwaved brought to us you know what i mean it's like we we're actually really inept yeah. and we have to make these externalities yeah. right in order for us to survive so that's just our particular way but to echo on that it's really crazy because a lot of the ways that we interpret behavior and we interpret animal studies and things like that is what we call anthropomorphized mm -hmm. uh, we're anthropomorphizing it means like we're we're making it comparable to human behavior, wow, right? Okay. So for example, with as we touched on the mirror test, just to break that down a little bit, they'll give an animal uh, a particular marking, they'll put like a red dot on their head, and then with chimps, we the, the, the monkey will look in the mirror and then go, oh, what's this red dot? They'll physically touch it, yeah. right? And then that for us is to say, oh, okay, well now we know that the monkey recognizes itself yeah. And the alteration to itself by touching the mark, right? But now imagine you're a dolphin. You can't touch your head, uh, yeah. right? So you can't you can't do this. You can't mark your head, right? Yeah. So how do we know that the dolphin is now conscious? What happens with that? They'll put the mark on their side, yeah. and then what happens is they'll when they're in the mirror, they put the mirror underwater, obviously. But the dolphin will slick to one side, the side which the dot is on, and that we infer. Mm -hmm. The fact that, oh, it's it's now aware of that. Yeah. But the interesting thing is we need to now understand animal behavior and alterations of animal mm -hmm. behavior to make sure that they understand or, or that we can infer that they yeah. are conscious due to this practice. So it's such an interpretive practice. And, and the closer that they are to mirroring us in terms of the monkey, the monkey can actually touch. Right? So we can say, okay, the monkey's conscious. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he touched it. He touched it with his hand. Right? Because they have hands. Right? Mm -hmm. What about the animals that don't have hands? Yeah. Right? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. now we have to have this whole other process of inference to say whether or not we know that the animal is understanding the alteration to itself, mm -hmm. which means it's understanding itself. There's like so many layers of inference. You know, yeah. of assumption mm -hmm. that that happen in, in our scientific process. It's. It, I find it to be like. At, at some point, and that for me, in my opinion, like it's almost, I don't want to say it's useless, but it's like 
I feel like these animals, if you just observe them in their behavior, you're able to really just see what they're about, what their personality is like, what what do they like to do. Yeah. And then, like, you know, us doing these tests is like, how aware are they? And then let's just say we find out they're super aware. What are you going to do next? Now you're going to give one mm-hmm. a talk show. You know what I'm saying? Was it Mr. Ed? Was it Mr. Ed? <laughs> <laughs> dolphin talk show. Yeah. Why not? That might, that might be interesting. I can see that. Yo, it's Dolphin Week here. We got Mr. Yo, dolphin. We got, we got Daniel the Dolphin. <laughs> This is Stu. He's yeah, here to yeah. uh, communicate with yeah, us. Yeah, was... um, <laughs> damn, where was I going with that? <laughs> yeah, you know, the conscious endeavor. We're just talking about perception, reality, and mm-hmm. it's to circle back all the way to reality, right? Just mm-hmm. just back to what it is. Yeah, I mean, also, we were talking about adaptation, the process of adaptation, which I think is really cool. And I did want to cycle back, actually, a little bit to when we were talking about, also, we got to answer that question about consciousness. That's, yeah. that's everyone in the yeah. room is like, come on, come on, how do you define consciousness scientifically, right? Um, I right, sit down, guys. But on, um, <laughs> I did want to touch on when we were talking about sensory deprivation, right? We, we mentioned the people in the cave, right? You know, lack of visual processing, their brain gets utilized for other measures. We talked about sensory deprivation here in the, in the West. You know, you can actually pay probably 50 to to $100 to sit in a, a pool full of water and yeah. just be, you know, uh, you know, consciously present, no visual stimulus, no auditory stimulus. What happens with a lot of people who do those sensory deprivation tanks, a lot of times they hallucinate. Yeah. Technically speaking, they're hallucinating. Hallucinate. They're hallucinating, yeah. right? Because your brain is lacking or your brain is used to a certain level, reticent level of sensory input. Mm. All of a sudden, when you bring that all the way to zero, even when you're sleeping, like your eyes are closed, mm. right? You might still have a perception of light behind your eyelids. You still have sounds of vents and things like that. You have the feeling of, you know, uh, the pillows or whatever's around you, right? You know what I mean? So you still have some sort of sensory input. You may be down to 30%, right? But mm-hmm. like when you go into sensory deprivation, you're floating. So you kind of lose sense of your body, mm-hmm. right? You lose the felt sense. You lose the auditory stimulus. You lose the vision. We lose all of those things. So when you when you go all the way down to zero, your brain is like, what the hell, yeah. right? So yeah. it starts actually now reverberating some of this electrical energy. And I've had this in meditation, actually, when I sit down for, if I haven't meditated in a while, I'll actually kind of see like little pulses in my mm. peripheral. And it's almost like the the calming of the storm, you know what I mean? All this light input all the time is coming at us. And we kind of have this, you know, constant bombardment of sensory input. But when we try to like bring it down, you got to understand like the reverberations of the electrical potential. Like, you know, sensation is electrical potential entering the brain. But, you know, for example, auditory stimulus, it gets interpreted, mm-hmm. right? We're interpreting the words we're hearing, right? Which is other parts of the brain reverberating that pressure wave that's coming at us and mm-hmm. interpreting and internalizing, integrating that information. So there's other parts of the brain which when in, induced to a stimulus, introduced to a stimulus, mm. it will continue to bounce that information around, potentially interpret it, understand it, whatever, whatever. So there's a lot of echoing in a way if we think about it. Like if you, oh. if you yell into a canyon, it's going to echo for a while before it stops. And this mm. is what the importance of sensory deprivation is, is that we let that echo, this nervous system, what I like to call like... Um, Resonance, mm. you know, like nerve, the resonance in the nervous system actually kind of come down and, you know, come to a reticent level. And then all of a sudden you're at this, like, you know, you're resetting. What I like to say is you're resetting your neurological baseline, right? Where the baseline is and, and how that mm. operates. But it's, you know, it's wild as uh, the, the verbiage you're using as mm-hmm. you're talking about sensory deprivation and, you know, lights and how I could see it like it's ultimately like activating in a way, right? Like you're, mm-hmm. you're turning things on sound bowl healing or the gong i have had an outer body experience with the gong like i went to his yoga place in manhattan um, and as i was just laying there homie hit the guy was hitting the gong and all of a sudden these waves start coming out these sound waves just start coming out and like (laughs) (laughs) exactly and then the dolphin no check it (laughs) it just starts coming out and next thing you know i'm having this outer body experience and i see myself yeah, actually, I shouldn't disclose this, but maybe why not? I see myself in my own basement at that time. It was just wild because I'm like, that has something to do with activating yourself. And mm-hmm. sound waves, we know, are vital for healing. You know, they use them in many cultures, not just, you know, yeah. not just Tibet, not just like India. You know, they, it's just, it's it's been utilized throughout the world and it's important to tap in with that. Yeah. Music is universal. Yeah. Every yeah. culture that has ever existed on the planet yeah. has had music. Had their own music, fire dances, 
drumming, whatever. Every single culture has had music, so we, it's, yeah, it's highly some, integral. Yeah, we got some musicians on this show too. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, who, who are those it? people? Yeah. I don't know who those, <laughs> who's that guy. Yeah, um, coming soon too. You know, we'll, we'll be sure to incorporate that in yeah, one of our yeah, shows. Yeah, yeah. So consciousness. Yeah, reverberance, resonance, <laughs> yes, right? awesome. all of these things, coherence, right? These are actually our terms. I mean, harmony and dissonance, right? Mm. They talk about cognitive dissonance, which is another interesting thing in parallel in terms of music, uh, because we create harmony with two tones that work well together, yeah. right? Term, uh, tones that don't work well together are dissonant, yeah. right? We can have ideas in ourselves, self-facilitating ideas or ideas that are detrimental to the self, right? Yeah. And whether those ideas are harmonious with the person, mm -hmm. right? Or we, if we have two ideas that are conflicting, right? Those are cognitively dissonant, mm -hmm. right? So there are a lot of parallels and even like, you know, just analogies in that sense. It helps us understand um, you know, because the cognitive space is literally invisible, right? So for yeah. us to actually start to break that down and understand that, it's like, you know, it becomes really interesting. Um, but to touch on consciousness just in general, we we'll start to talk about some of the science that we, we've been promising you guys, yeah. right? So <laughs> there's this whole science, or, or at least the uh, areas of the brain that they've been keying into is terms of resting conscious the resting conscious mind and in this case i don't really want to attribute it solely to consciousness but i do want to attribute it just to the idea of the resting mm. mindset right so when you're in your resting mindset there's a couple areas of the brain active um it's like the precuneus the the medial frontal lobe um there's a couple like four or five areas and they all essentially they call them the, the default mode network so if you want to do some googling google the default mode network and DFT. you can and yeah. actually, yeah, DMN or whatever it is, right? <laughs> so they can, um, yeah. you know, they, all these areas of the brain, essentially what they're doing is one of them is in the frontal lobe, which is, you know, rationale and reasoning, mm -hmm. cost-benefit analysis type stuff. The other part, the precuneus, is actually involved in autobiographical memory, mm. right? So you're literally thinking about the things that affect you, thinking about your life path, thinking about all these things and, and assessing and creating an assessment. I think the other one is close to the hippocampus, I can't remember the exact area, but it's another area involved in memory, mm -hmm. right? So memory, autobiographical information, uh, conscious reasoning, all of these parts of the brain mm -hmm. give us a picture to some extent of what happens when our mind is idle, right? So when we're just kind of sitting there and, and relaxing and thinking about life and looking around, maybe sitting in a park, right, looking at the grass and whatever, right, there's a certain parts of the brain which in these what we call task negative um, aspects, mm -hmm. Um, this, these parts of the brain become active. And we say task negative because most of the time what brain studies do is like, well, look at this image and then we see what parts of the brain activate. Do this math problem and then we'll see what parts of your brain activate. That's, that way we know what part of the brain is involved in a math problem, for example, right? Mm -hmm. That's task positive. So when we don't give them a task, we call that task negative. And there's a bunch of studies now being done on like the task negative state of the brain mm -hmm. and what that means. But I'd have to say, I think consciousness in and of itself is potentially a much deeper state, right? We're looking at autobiographical information, rationale and reasoning, right? These are things that, okay, you're assessing yourself, you're assessing your situation in life, things mm. like that, which are still externalized thought processes, mm. right? Me in society. Mm. Who am I in relationship to the people I know and, you know, my relationships in general, right? Things like that. Those are self-assessment. Mm. Um, I do think consciousness again, is another layer deeper than that, synonymous with general awareness mm -hmm. and still being struggled to be you know, studied by science. We will go further in those definitions. We will get there. And the brain, too, because uh, you just went over uh, quite a few things yeah. about the brain. I th we'll, we'll have an episode about the brain, too. Yeah. And um, I got a lot of questions for a professor over here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think uh, this has been an amazing um, discussion, um, and I appreciate everyone tuning in. You know, this is Conscious of Denver. I'm Timeless Dayub, and Daniel, want to wrap it up? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, tune in next week. We'll continue to talk about reality, consciousness, the self, the brain, all the good stuff. Um, so we're going to hit um, all that stuff next week, and um, we'll see you guys then. Ciao. Tuning out. See you guys. Check the links in the description. Um, you know, link up with us personally, individually, um, throwing some workshops uh, coming here in the future. Nice. Uh, Timeless Ty have always offering um, personal sessions, uh, tuning in with him as well. So key in those links, check the links in the description. And we'll see you guys next week. All right, grad dude. <laughs>